everyone. Welcome to GLEF 2020. It is a great honor for me to participate GLEF 2020 and give a lecture about the history of campus students movement. But I tell you, it's not easy to give over a thousand years of the history of campus students movement. But I will try my best to follow the flow of campus mission through the early universities, looking at their spiritual influence in their times and find out how God used the students for spiritual revival. As you know, uh, God's ministry is not smooth sailing all the time, nor prosperous all the time. There is always spiritual stagnation in each generation but wherever the established churches were crafted and lost spiritual direction, there is always students who sense the problem and challenge the corruption of churches. To me, they were the salt and the light of the world. They were heroes and heroines in God's ministry and world mission. Let's look at timeline first. Because without understanding timelines, it's very hard to understand the students' movement. These timelines are divided by the biblical theologians and scholars. So let's look at uh, AD 30 to 500, we call the early Christianity. And 500 to uh, 1054, the Christian early Middle Age or a uh, new order. 1055 to 1516, the Christian high middle age, scholasticism. And 1517 to 1648, we call the age of reformation. And 1780 to 1910, we call the age of progress. And 1914 to 1989, we call the ideologies. Do you know what happened in 1989? Maybe you know. Maybe German people know. <laughs> the Berlin Wall was broke down. Okay? Now, I like to uh, emphasize uh, uh, some timelines. Among this timeline, I highlight a few important events so that I can concentrate. So, uh, if you look at here, uh, 880, Charlemagne crowned the Holy Roman Emperor. 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1088, University of Bologna in Italy was founded. And 1150, the University of Paris and Oxford was also founded. And 1380, it, uh, Wycliffe's uh, Spobai's English Bible translation, and 1415, Chan Fu's was burned at stake, and 1675, Spanner's Pia Desideria advanced uh, pietism, 1732, the first Moravian missionary was sent, and 1807, Samuel Mills led Hasek prayer meeting, and 1886, students' volunteer movement began in Princeton University. If you want to know more about these events, uh, you can look at my paper on the web. It lays out very specifically, so you can uh, see the uh, events, okay? Now, I want to talk about a little uh, about history, the holy Roman Empire. Do you know about the Holy Roman Empire? I think you do, but some of you do not know about, uh, about it. Holy Roman Empire. What is the Holy Roman Empire? But before talking about the Holy Roman Empire, I'd like to talk about also Roman Empire briefly. You know the Roman Empire was founded 753 uh, BC and stood until 476 AD. The Roman Empire 
was lasted 1,229 years, the longest empire in human history. But by the end of the 4th century, barbarians began to invade the Roman empires like Biscuit, Goods, uh, Vandals, and Franks, many other uh, uh, barbarian tribes. And the Roman Empire was crumbled by them uh, in seven, uh, 476. Those barbarian tribes created their own kingdoms and ruled their territories from the end of the fifth centuries. But there were endless war among themselves. It was chaotic. In this chaotic situation out of Arabia, in 7th century, the forgotten corner of the world, Muslim, was born and began to threaten the world. In a few years, they conquered the ancient Roman territories like the Middle East, including Jerusalem, Egypt, Northern Africa, Spain, up to Tours in France. Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne, defeated the Roman army at the Battle of Tours in 732. If Charles Martel did not defeat the Roman uh, Muslim army, Europe might have been Muslim world. It is very sad to know that entire Christian areas like Middle East, Jerusalem, Damascus, Syria, Turkey, Egypt, Northern Africa, and Spain were in Arab's hand, and Christians were inhalated by the Roman uh, Muslim armies. People talk about the uh, crusade, and the Christians killed many Muslims, but in fact, the Muslims killed Christians more than any <laughs> uh, armies throughout the world. In these circumstances, people longed for a strong empire like Rome so that they might be protected by the invaders. For this, Pope Leo III chose Charlemagne, the Frankie, uh, Frankish king, crowned him as the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor on December 25th, 880. Now let's think from here, what does it mean to you, Pope crowned Roman Emperor? It means Pope was above the Emperor. Suddenly, Roman Catholic Popes had the highest power over celestial world. You know, the absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Now they could dispose the king at will. They could sell and buy church positions. Church position was not uh, inherited by scholars or theologians, but anyone who has money, they can be church leaders. Under those, such a circumstances, the more serious problem was the ordinary people who suffer under such corrupted popes. The entire life of the church was put at risk in many beautiful, faithful believers. Indeed, they were sheep without the shepherd. So the Reformation started in monastery first among the monks. But it was no use because monastery also belonged to the head of the Roman Catholic. Out of desperation, the Christian theologians and scholars moved out of the monasteries and found the universities. Now, do you know what is the original meaning of university? The original meaning of university was guild or association, or partnership. University is not a place where students gather and uh, study like present time, right? Those who had the same 
kind of work from the guild for mutual benefit. Likewise, theologians and scholars established universities to study the Bible in order to be free from the influence of popes. Now, the center of theological activity moved out of monastery to the universities. They say that uh, Universal Bologna in Italy was founded first, but theological activities were more vigorous at University of Paris and Oxford. So if you see this picture, the first one is University of uh, Paris, the second one is uh, University of Oxford. Do you know when it was founded? 1150. Long time ago. Thousand years ago, right? Okay. Now, many Franciscans and Dominicans scholars taught those uh, schools. In university, the students studied the Bible and discussed theology freely. Soon, these studies which were vast association of the scholars, spread in the principal cities, and many students began flocking around those scholars on the campuses. So, I want to ask you one more time, what is the meaning of a university? Yes, to study the Bible freely. I want to ask you one more thing. Do you know what is the first mission for Dominicans? When we think about Dominicans, they say the Dominican universities. But their first mission was to convert the Jews and Muslims to Christianity. For example, there was a Dominican preacher named William, William Tropolis. Tropolis is presently Libya, right? William Tropolis went to Tropoli and preached the gospel to the Muslims. And he made a big uh, church in there. Now it's gone. I want to ask you one more thing. Do you know that Francis of Assisi? I think everybody knows the Francis of Assisi. Some people say that he was uh, advocator of animals and birds. He talked with the birds. But do you know that Francis of Assisi went to Egypt as a missionary? Yes, he did. There was uh, one Franciscan who went to Persia, Ethiopia, and India, and they called Kambaluk, which means Beijing now, to preach the gospel. You can read the other stories about uh, in my papers. Okay. It is amazing to know even the early universities raised the missionaries to preach the gospel to all nations. Why? Because the every gospel there is word to preach the gospel to all nations. Now I would like to introduce two individuals who influenced the campus mission and then introduce campus movement by schools. Okay, as I said, I would like to introduce two individuals who influenced the campus mission and then introduces campus movement by schools. Um, you know, uh, the history is uh, very uh, interesting to me. Whenever I talk about history, I was so excited. So I can talk uh, many, many, many hours until people were bored to listen to me. But some people's history is... Uh, not so interesting. They said, so what? So what? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, it's not easy. I know. It, we talk about the old story, but uh, let's a little bit uh, give your heart to listen to these uh, five uh, topics, okay? All right. First, I like to talk about John Wycliffe's. Uh, he was uh, born in the farmland near London. They said about 200 kilometers. He entered the uh, Oxford University at the age of 16. Wow, 16 years old, entered the university. 
he was famous in his logic and became a professor at Oxford University at the age of 23. He taught uh, philosophy and uh, polemics. He taught about, uh, about 20 years. At the age of 41, he was called by the crown to be a diplomat. So he uh, was diplomat to in uh, Roman Catholic Vatican. And, but, you know, he really, really want to return to school to teach. So after 10 years of a diplomat, he returned to Oxford. And then there is a trouble. He began to uh, challenge the Roman Catholic popes over authority over the world. He quoted Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Do you know what is Mark chapter 10, verse 45? Yes. Jesus did not come to, uh, to be served, but to serve, right? He challenged with this verse to the Pope to serve his people instead of being served. This got him trouble. He was accused by 18 accounts by the Roman Catholic. He was called the Master of Eros. But uh, Wycliffe did not shut up. He said more about the Pope. He said that Pope and uh, churches were second, second in authority in Scripture. Then do you know what happened? He was under uh, house arrest. But he, he ignored their uh, order. He went to his church and preached the uh, messages on Sundays. And while he was studying, he found an error in Roman Catholic communi communion. We call Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. Very difficult word, right? That's the meaning of uh, communion on church. Do you know that uh, Roman Catholic, they have, uh, still have a communion? Every Sunday, they drink wine and eat the bread, right? But Roman Catholic said that communion is a symbol. But he said, no, that's not true. He said, God was joined in human nature. The presence of a divinity did not destroy the humanity, he said. Likewise, what takes place in communion is that the body of Christ is present in the bread. So when we eat the bread, it's like eating the body of Christ. Then Roman Catholic declared him as a heretic. One Sunday, while he was delivering the message, he died of a stroke, and he was buried in that church. But the Roman Catholic council condemned him and burned. He, they dig out his body out of the tomb and burned his body and throw the ashes in the river. But his disciples took a little bit of ashes and carried away. They carried away all the time. His disciples uh, were called Lollard. And that Lollard meaning is actually mumblers. They mumble. When they pray, they mumble, Oh Lord God, have a new father. Something like that, mumblers. So these numblers went around and taught his teacher's belief. And they said that Bible belonged to the people, not church. This is a great challenge. Roman Catholic believe that Bible is belong to their church. And nobody can interpret the Bible except them. But Eclipse disciples, they challenged the Roman Catholic saying that Bible is belong to the people. What a challenge. So in fact, we can say that they became forerunners of the Protestant Reformation. His teaching impacted Bohemia's presently Czech Republic, especially John Fus. So what are the two things you can learn from 
John Wycliffe. You can think about it. You can talk to your friends. Okay, there is two things you clearly tells in here. Second, John Fuse, we call pre-reformer, before Martin Luther. I think people does not know about him much, but he is very important important uh, person in Christian history. He was a famous preacher, scholar, rector at the University of Prague. Prague. You know, one day uh, Martin Luther was at the school library, and he, moving around, found the volumes of sermons by Chan Hus. Luther was amazed by Chan Hus' writings. Later, Martin Luther said, "I could not understand why such such a great man. What caused Roman Catholic?" had burned such a great man who explains the scriptures with gravity and skill. You know, uh, John Fuss was a hero to Martin Luther. And Martin Luther could uh, have first reformation because of John Fuss's influence. When John Fuss was young, he was so poor. His father was a very poor farmer. To escape uh, poverty, he entered the schools, and he was smart enough to get his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in theology. And then he became an excellent scholar, preacher, and rector at the University of Prague. If you see this uh, the statue, that's a statue of uh, Chan Fus. He preached Prague's most prestigious church, Bethlehem. But the uh, time was a really uh, difficult time. At his time, there was three popes. Do you believe that there was three popes? One in uh, Rome, one in, in uh, Pizza, Pizza, and one in Avignon in France. And anyway, at the Church Council, Roman Catholic Church Council in Pisa in 1409, Roman Catholic de- deposed the two popes and elected Alexander V as a pope. After Alexander V, Chan XXIII became a pope. It was trouble. John, uh, Pope John uh, XXIII was a very ambitious man. And suddenly, two other popes were uh, 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 found because of his corruption. So what he did was he authorized uh, selling the indulgences to raise funds to crusade against one of his rivals. And then uh, John Fuse saw that Pope was acting in mere self-interest, right? And John Fuse preached that unworthy Pope was not to be obeyed. His preaching was very popular, supported by the crowds. But this got him a trouble. He was summoned to Rome to answer for, uh, for his acting of uh, disobedience, but he refused to go. He knew that he would be killed, right? Then uh, he was excommunicated, excommunicated, excommunicated in 1411. And uh, he was also called again at the uh, Constance to believe him, uh, to promise him to save return to Prague. But when he got there, Roman Catholic authority arrested him and burned him at stake. When he was burned, he prayed like Jesus. Lord Jesus, I pray you to have mercy on my enemies. His followers took some of his ashes, buried on the ground of Prague, 
where the uh, statue is uh, now in Prague. He did two great things. First, the influence Moravian vision movement and influence Martin Luther. That's the reason we call him pre-reformer. Martin Luther's reformation was possible because of him. Moravian could raise many missionaries because of John Fuss. So we have to really uh, uh, know about John Fuss. I hope that someone study about John Fuss and report about it. Now uh, I introduce two people, two individuals, and now I'd like to go over uh, campus movement by schools, right? Well, um, it's not easy to talk about this campus uh, movement because, you know, if we want to talk about the campus movement, even one campus like Oxford, we need uh, like hours to talk about. But I made uh, maybe uh, six, seven minutes about it. It's not easy. So, uh, you know, uh, please understand uh, this uh, lecture, okay? All right. So I want to combine the uh, Oxford and Cambridge movement uh, together, okay? So in order to uh, talk about the Cambridge and Oxford movement, campus movement, I have to talk about uh, the world history. You know Renaissance, right? So let's talk about a little bit uh, Renaissance. Okay, after Renaissance in 17th and 18th centuries, human thoughts ruled the people's mind and hearts. Before, people believed God, right? But atheism and deism were popular among students. Atheism, you know what is atheism, right? Do you know what is deism? Deism is believe that God's uh, creation power is limited. So God is not overrule us, you know, any generation, but only ruled in the Genesis time. That's the basic ideas. Okay. So Europe's country in 17th and 18th century was very rich. Do you know why? Because of colonization. Their merchant ships reached every corner of the world, brought wealth to their countries on the protection of their powerful naval fleets. Spain, England, Dutch, they are so rich. They bring all the wealth from other countries. And then there was the first industrial revolution. Do you know what is the first uh, uh, industrial revolution used? They're using the water and steam power to mechanize bath production. Now, they can make a thousand shoes in one time or clothing one time, right? Can you imagine that big steam trains ran everywhere at such high speed? People became so proud of themselves and their achievement that they put themselves above God. Now, two things. Because of thoughts and this uh, uh, technology, really, they began to abandon the God. Do you know what happened? This spiritual corruption hit the people's mind. In London, one-fourth unmarried woman became prostitution. They did prostitution. Can you believe that? And one-eighth of the people died with alcoholism. Spiritual corruption is like this. On camp college campuses, students were same. They want to enjoy their youth to the full extent. In Oxford, 
There are many interesting clubs among students, like wit club. Do you know what the wit club means? Joke club. Ha the handsome club. <laughs> they say they're handsome, so they uh, gathered together and uh, made the handsome club. There was also nonsense club. Can you believe that nonsense? <laughs> this, is a, uh, this was the spiritual condition. In this spiritual condition, Charles Wesley and his brother John Wesley, there is another man named William Morgan, and John Voice, the son of the Oxford City Mayor, and George Whitfield made the Holy Club. They were ridiculed by other students. They were called Methodists because other students see that they study the Bible methodically. Do you know how many times they met? They met four times a week for Bible study. Once they, uh, one time a week, they read the Greek Bible. Therefore, spiritual influence was so great, even though there are few people. We know that John Wesley founded the Methodist Church later, right? And his, uh, he, he, uh, he and his brother, Charles and George Whitfield, brought the gospel to America and uh, made the first and second awakening in America. It was great. If there is a John Wesley, there is a called uh, there is a Charles Simeon in Cambridge. Charles Simeon is a very interesting man. He had a Bible study meeting at the top of the school dormitory after dinner. They called this Bible study group as the open tea parties. But other students knew that they are not drinking uh, teas, right? They called Simeonent meaning Simeon's fools. Simeon loved the exegetical uh, messages. He was, uh, uh, once he was invited uh, to deliver the Sunday message at the uh, St. Mary Church near campus. While he was delivering message, the bad boy from the Cambridge came and disturbed his message. They shouted at him, but he remained calm completed his message. One of those bad boys from Cambridge was moved by his message. Later, he became a Christian. You know, uh, after graduation, Simeon became a pastor at Holy Trinity Church. Then he became an administrator at King's College in Cambridge. This is a history. He organized four campus Bible study groups. Later, these four uh, campus Bible group uh, become a one organization, the Cambridge Intercollegiate uh, Christian Union called CICCU. From CICCU, the most world famous organization was formed like InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and Interval International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, IVCF and IFCES. So if we look at it, these uh, two uh, campuses, uh, Oxford University, basically, they did church founding. Cambridge Movement founded a student's organization and you know, missionary uh, organization. If I have time, I would talk about the Cambridge Seven, which, uh, you know, how does it tell you uh, went as a missionary in uh, China? But uh, we will talk about uh, later, okay? Anyway, uh, Oxford Students Movement found the churches, but Cambridge Movement raised many world-famous organizations and did world mission. Now, I want to talk about the German Pirates Movement. Is there anyone who knows about the 30 years war in Europe between 1618 to 1648? 
it was the basically war between the Protestant and the Catholic states. The result was devastating. Eight millions of people died. Among them, were 20% of the German population died. Can you believe that? When the war was over, however, the Protestant churches were recognized. Luther's ministers reorganized Luther's theology, and pious pietism was born. Piet, pietism refers to, to the German Christian movement led by Philip Spanner and Augustine Frank. Spanner was a Lutheran uh, pastor in Frankfurt. And actually, he, he went to mine too. He found a Bible study group and devotional group that he called College of uh, Piety. He also wrote a book called Pia Desteria, Pious Desire. In his book, he said that there is no differences between laity or clergy. Rather, all Christians share a common responsibility. This inspired people, lay mission movement. We thought before that people thought, you know, all Bible study and the missionary have to be a clergy, a pastor or a minister. But he brought this uh, idea, lay mission. Frank was a uh, Spanish follower. Uh, he was a professor at the uh, University of Halle. He taught Latin and Greeks. He developed the concept of world mission through lay missionary influenced by uh, Spanner. Do you know what happened? He made a mission center at school founded by King of Denmark. You know, he sent numerous missionaries to India and other countries before William Carey. People did not know it. But actually, modern missionary was founded by uh, Frankie. Very interesting story coming out. Spanner's cousin, Nicholas Zindendorf, studied under Frank at the University of Halle. That's a history, right? On the Frank's uh, training, Zindendorf became a well-equipped servant of God. Who is Zindendorf? You know it, right? Later, he joined the Moravian movement. And uh, we know that Moravian, Moravians sent numerous missionaries to Africa, India, South and uh, North America. Perhaps the greatest significance of Moravian movement and its impact was uh, John Wesley, who was born again through Moravians. So let me let me uh, talk about uh, John Wesley, how he met Jesus personally through Moravians. Okay? 1735, John, was, uh, John Wesley was invited by Georgia governor James Edward as a chaplain for the new colon colony of Georgia in America. So his, he and his brother Charles sailed to America in the hope of achieving more self-discipline and preaching the gospel to American Indians, they traveled for eight weeks. One day, they faced a tremendous, tremendous Atlantic storm that hit the ship and split the main mast. John was scared to death. So do you know what happened? He went down the bottom of the ship but he heard the sim, him singing, and he went up, and he saw the unbelievable calm of Moravians who sang throughout the audio. John came to bitter realization of salvation. 
So, actually, he failed the ministry at uh, Savannah, Georgia, and returned to London. Upon his return, he visited a Moravian pastor named Peter Boiler. Peter taught John Wesley justification by faith. So when he was invited to the Moravian meeting, uh, he was a kind of reluctant, uh, you know, but he went. There he heard reading from Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Martin Luther explained the change which God works in the hearts through faith in Jesus Christ. John Wesley felt that his heart was strangely warmed. Later, he confessed that he felt he did trust Christ and Christ alone for salvation and an assurance for given to him. And for the first time, he realized that he was, uh, God was taking away his sins and he was saved from that moment. He said, I was saved from the law of sin and death. Later, John Wesley was invited to the uh, Moravian uh, meetings, but he said, I want to concentrate my ministry in England. Actually, uh, that's why he didn't join the uh, Moravian movement, but uh, he made a uh, church, Methodist church, right? He, after that, his preaching was so powerful, not only in England, but in America. And we know that because of his preaching brought millions of people to Christ. All right, we finished the story of John Wesley. So let's go back to the uh, story of Franke. Franke made Spanner and Franke Pais the training center at the University of Halle. Do you know how, uh, how many people, how many students came to there to receive training? The spiritual leadership training? 6,000. Yes, 6,000 students came and received the spiritual training, leadership training. All these 6,000 people became professors and ministers. And I believe that the German Christianity is the foundation of uh, Franke. He also uh, built Danish Halle Missionary Center and sent out numerous missionaries all over the world. I found out that there are very five quite simple guidelines uh, missionary center. And it was very interesting to me. So I like to uh, show this, these five guidelines. First, study the Bible diligently daily. How simple is that? Yes, <laughs> they encourage them, study the Bible diligently every day. The second, do not pursue merely the Bible knowledge, but practice what have you will learn. Yes. This is very important in our spiritual life. We like to pursue Bible uh, knowledge. But if there is no practice, that's useless. So I am encouraging uh, New Jersey Cokers and German Cokers and Cokers throughout the world, you know, instead of trying to learn the Bible knowledge and argue, <laughs> love to argue, but uh, practice it, what we have learned. The third one is avoid the Bible, biblical arguments, and recommend the Bible verses with the love of God. This is important, yes. Yeah. We love to argue Bible uh, you know, um, knowledge, right? The, about the Holy Spirit, about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But instead of uh, arguing, we should avoid the uh, biblical arguments, but recommend the Bible verse with love of God. Fourth, be a responsible person. Wow, this is very simple. But Jesus is very responsible. 
he was a man of responsibility and fulfilled uh, his duty to die for the sin of the world. And the last one is interesting. Be priesthood of all nations. This is a UVF title, right? Be a kingdom priest and holy nation. So it is really amazing to know how much German piety movement impacted Christian history and even uh, uh, German history, especially Zinzendorf, uh, John Wesley. If I have a time, I really want to share with you a story of Zinzendorf later. Okay, so let's finish up the uh, German pious movement. Okay, I want to go to next American haystack movement. Okay, this is the last part, uh, American uh, haystack movement. So, how'd you like it so far? I know that it was boring, right? Uh, so I would like to have one joke with you. There was one uh, Korean old lady immigrating in America, right? She learned driving. And uh, one time she, she was driving, she drove so fast and he caught by police. And since she came to America, you know, uh, you know a few months ago, her English was not so good. So she said, 한 번만 봐주세요. Please look at me once. And the police uh, didn't understand what she was saying. Please look at me once. What does it mean, please look at me once? <laughs> so um, he called the uh, headquarters of uh, police department and looking for Korean. Korean police and uh, the you know he talked to Korean uh, police and he said oh this lady said please look at me once I look at her once twice third but I did not know what it was uh, she was saying and then uh, the police uh, uh, Korean police said say to her today there is no soup 오늘은 국물도 없다 so this police came came to that lady and said. No soup today. And this lady got so upset. You know, I begged her, uh, you know, uh, please look at me once. But he said, uh, no soup today. So she got upset and said, no uh, chalata, happy birthday. And, uh, and uh, you know, the police said, what, the, what is that to me, happy birthday? Okay, so anyway, Korean, uh, uh, you know, literal interpretation, literal translation is sometimes a make really funny, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Now, let me talk about the uh, American haystack movement. Uh, this is a long story, but I try to really shorten up, <laughs> made, uh, maybe uh, uh, five minutes, okay? So let's go back to history. We have to understand the history. The 17th century, America was still called New World, right? Pilgrims came from Europe in order to find religious freedom. But after independence of America in 1776 and French Revolution in 1789, Atheistic rationalism smelled into the hearts of people in America. Christianity was ridiculed in the end of the 18th century and 19th century. Once a uh, president of uh, Princeton University went up to the uh, podium to speak to the students' assembly, at the students' assembly, when he read the Bible verses, some students draw a deck of poker cards at him. That was the special condition of America. But hope of God is never died. The hope of God lightened among the college campuses through Bible studies. In Harvard, there was 
Christian Bible Society. They study the Bible. They met the campus for Bible studies. And there was the haystack movement at William College through Samuel Mills. Samuel Mills invited his four friends for Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesdays and Saturdays on the campus. Campus, there is a uh, river. Uh, they call the uh, heat of Husek River. In August of 1806, while they were returning from Bible study, suddenly rain came, poured out. They could not find any shelter, so they went to a haystack to avoid heavy rain. Right? On the haystack, Samuel Mills said, if we will, we can do it. We can do world mission. So Mills and his uh, four friends called this a uh, haystack movement. They began to call their friends for world mission. Soon, the number increased 525. Among the 525 students, 50%. Nearly 260 uh, of them went as your missionaries to the foreign land. Can you believe that? After graduation from William College, Samuel Mills entered the Andover Seminary School in Boston. In there, he met Adonri uh, Ram Jadison. It's very hard to uh, pronounce Adonri Ram. His name is actually in the Bible. Edward Ram Jason from Brown University, Samuel Lowell from Harvard University, Samuel Knott from uh, Union University. They formed the first American Board of uh, Commissions for Foreign Mission, ABCFM, ABCFM, in 1812. From this organization, Jadison, Noel, Nott, Luther Rice, and Golden Hall went to Asia missionaries, first missionaries we call in America. Do you know uh, who, are, uh, who are the uh, most greatest uh, modern missionaries? They are William Carey in India, right? Hudson Taylor in China. Do you know who is the third one? Ado Ram Jadison to Myanmar, presently Myanmar, Burma. We know uh, William Carey and Hudson Taylor very well, but we do not, we do not know much about Jadison. If I have a chance, I would like to tell you about Jadison because his mission is so incredible. And uh, his mission field in uh, Myanmar, he lost his first wife and two daughters. And uh, he married the second wife, but she died there too. He, he married the third one, she died too in, uh, in uh, Myanmar. So uh, one time I went to uh, Myanmar, I saw his church in uh, Langun, capital city of Myanmar. And here, um, we can see the importance of haystack movement. This organization influenced the world mission from America. They sent the first missionaries from America. Now, I would like to talk about uh, students' volunteer movement called SVM and how it formed. In 1886, D.L. Moody held a conference for college students at the Mountain Hermon near Boston. Okay, do you know about the Students Volunteer Movement, SVM, and how it formed? The story is like this. Uh, 1886, D.L. Moody held a conference for college students because that time college students were so much onto it in world mission. 
So he had a conference at Mount Helmond near Boston. 251 representatives from 89 universities attended. There was no uh, special program for two weeks. So some people gather together have a Bible study. Some people gather together one corner, praise worship, and uh, you know some group met together and talk about the spiritual fellowship, right? On the third day, um, Budi invited the edict in chief from World Mission Review magazine, Arthur Pearson, Dr. Pearson gave a special lecture on the evening, on the third day. His speech, all shall go and go to all, was so powerful that every student, 251 students signed up for World Mission. Among them, Robert Wilder from Princeton University was so moved. As soon as he came from conference, he made the students volunteer movement SVM and began to pray for to raise 100 missionaries through SVM. That was his hope, 100 missionaries. You know, this is really funny. Um, Samuel Wilder and his friend named John Foreman, he visited 160 universities in U.S. and Canada for 165 days by car. At the time, there was no plane, so they have to drive car and visit the campuses. And uh, by the end of the year, 2,106 students signed up for world mission. Can you believe that? Among them, there was 500 girls, girl students. And the world mission was uh, powerfully you know, uh, started by SVM. In 1910, there was the World Missionary Conference in Wittenberg, Scotland. They reported that SVM sent the most missionaries, 4,346 missionaries all over the world. But unfortunately, in 1959, SVM joined the National Uni uh, Students Christian Federation, NSCF, and disappeared soon. However, there is a fruit of SVM in our ministry. Sarah Berry went to Students Volunteer Movement Conference, signed up for World Mission. I don't know exactly the date and year, but she did. And she came to Korea in 1955. You know, after the Korean War, the world was, uh, the Korea was uh, devastated, right? So we can say that Mother Barry was the fruit of SVM. And the UBF was born because of uh, her. Isn't it an amazing story, SVM? So when we look at the campus students' movement, you know, we realize how much God used students for world mission. And uh, I can find that there are seven specific characteristics in uh, students' movement. And I want to uh, finish uh, by this, uh, saying this. The first was non-denominational. Students' movement is character is non-denomination. No. Students came, came from every denomination, even Catholics, right? And the students' movement is volunteer movement. They are volunteered. There is not, uh, you know, someone who wants to make a uh, students' movement organization by money, right? And very evangelical. Once they listen to the words, go to the whole world preached the gospel, they did, evangelical, and of course, world mission. They are not staying in one nation, but they want to go to the whole world. And the uh, important thing is here, their character are 
very apostolic character, very obedient. Once you listen, they have no second thought or calculation. They go to the, uh, obey the word of God absolutely. And their life is a Christ or gospel-centered life. They live very poorly, incredibly poorly. And one important thing, last of all, leadership training. In students' movement, there is always calling, confession. After confession, there is a discipleship training, and then commission as a missionary or leaders to other nations. I cannot say so much about students' movement in uh, maybe 30 to, 50, uh, 30 to uh, 40 minutes, but I can say that it is very important that God chose students for his uh, purpose always in every generation. i like to conclude with uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. He says, you are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. You know Matthew. Matthew, the former tax collector, very selfish man. He saw Jesus and his life of mission. He was so much moved and wrote Matthew chapter 5, 23 and 24. You are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. Same token, when I see students' movement, I like to want to say like Matthew, you are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. They are truly very important in human history to challenge the corruption of the world by becoming salt and light of the world. So I pray that our new generations in GRF be a salt and light of the world and preserve the corruption of this world. Thank you.